them will make very small exits, right? Um, maybe a few million, maybe tens of millions, you know, um, hardly ever cross 100 million to be a unicorn, which is defined to be a company that has a market capitalization of at least a billion dollars. Um, that's a very, very small fraction, typically, right? And so people attribute success to luck, right? If it's a roll of dice. But then, you know, um, it's also been observed that some people tend to be repeatedly lucky. And so the question becomes why? Well, my contention is that these people, they understand this journey, they plan for it, and then they go execute, right? They execute that plan. Um, and, and my contention is that the probability of success can be significantly, significantly improved um, if, um, if you follow these, the, if you know and follow these three things. Um, so that is, you know, going to be the main outline of this presentation. So we're going to talk about understanding this journey. We are going to plan it and, and we are going to execute the plan. All right. Um, all right. Um, so let, let's begin. So we're going to go, we're going to talk about the first um, the, the first part of this presentation, which is all about understanding the journey. I will spend most of my time, um, you know, in the in the first section, understanding the journey, um, some of it in planning and very little in execution, <laughs> which is actually the opposite. Uh, you would think I would do the reverse, but uh, but the reality is if you lay out the blueprint well, if you understand this journey well, and if you plan for it well, um, then execution just becomes a matter of uh, executing that blueprint, right? So that's the reason I'm um, going to spend more time on the first two sections than on the on the last section, right? So let's begin by understanding this journey. So the first um, question is why even start a company, right? And many entrepreneurs come to me for advice. And it's amazing that um, you know many uh, entrepreneurs are even uh, even confused about that part. So let's try to answer that in this slide. So on the left we have we show the world that exists before the company is formed. Um, on the right, yeah, you know we have um, the world with the company with the company in it, and and the job of the company is to take the world from the left to the right, right? So, so said another way, the job of the company is to improve the world in some way. So by the way, I'm talking about innovative companies. That's the kind of companies I do, the companies that bring something new to the world. There are other kinds of companies. There are companies that are, you know, um, they provide some sort of a service that is very similar to what other companies already do or there are companies that just replicate what other companies have done. I'm not talking about those kind of companies. I'm mainly talking about companies uh, that, that improve the world in some way, right? That take the world from the left to the right. So let's take some, some examples. The job of the company is to elevate the, the world in some way, right? Uh, so let's take some examples. Before Google came into the world, it was very hard to search for information on the internet. Uh, and Google improved the world um, by making search really easy. Um, when Apple came into, before Apple came into the world, the consumer devices were ugly, they were hard to use, and Apple showed us how, um, how to improve that. So, so that's the job of a company, and what it takes to go from the left to the right is, is vision plus execution. Um, right? So vision is the big idea that the company has and execution is well the execution or implementation of that idea so that sounds very easy right uh, you can have a big idea and you can execute on that and uh, imp sort of improve the world so then why why do so so many companies fail so so let's go through through some reasons why companies fail so number one 
look funding is very difficult right um, uh, most uh, entrepreneurs they are not um, born rich so to say they don't have uh, enough money to take the company from the start to finish until it becomes profitable uh, anyway building a big company profitability takes um, you know um, lots of years 5 10 years before the company becomes profitable so so you have to go raise from what are called venture capitalists and a typical venture capitalist right uh, there are you guys probably know uh, a venture capitalist or a vc firm they are in the business of lending money to startups um, and any given vc firm they have a number of venture partners people in the venture firm any one given partner goes through 1000 presentations in one year uh, from entrepreneurs and they select a handful right um, maybe at you know five on average five per year not more than that so so with those low odds you know funding is very difficult they may not be able to raise funding at all right? so that's number one the second problem is the vision might be too big um if your vision is too big it might take too long to build the product and uh, even if you raise money nobody gives you money uh, or sufficient money to take you from start to finish um funding might run out along the way you know you usually raise money in 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 a in a series of uh, funding raises right uh, so you may raise a few million at the beginning or or maybe even less than a million and then Uh, um then in the second round you raise a little bit more as you show progress and then a little bit more and so on and so forth and and if you can't show enough um progress towards you know completing your product and starting to sell it um a, a venture capitalist might say well they have such <laughs> money in the company um it's better that they not put more money behind bad money and put it elsewhere right so the funding might run out along the way um if the vision is too grand that's the problem on the flip side if the vision is too small it's also a problem um because competitors might find it easy to copy the product right so uh, so that's very hard right so you you, you had a great idea uh, you build the product but uh, and it's it initially might sell like hot cakes but then the competitors start copying it and you have nowhere to go so so you can see that this is a very difficult you know proposition if the vision is too grand it's a problem if the vision is too small it's a problem then the question becomes how the heck are we supposed to do companies right well i will show you in my future slides that i prefer if the vision is is grand is big but uh, there is a way to navigate that which i'll show you in my in my future slides but anyway to talk about more problems another one is that the market reception may not be good so you did this company right thinking that uh, the product will sell and people will buy but when it became time to sell the product you're not going to be able to sell the product on day one you probably take some time you know maybe a couple of years to build the product um and and then by the time you build it and try to sell it uh, you you get no reception um so these are just some of the problems that happen uh, because of which the companies die um and there are of course other problems so our job is to in this presentation navigate how we can um you know prevent some of this from happening and sort of increase the probability of success right so my contention is that uh, life is about probabilities it's never a zero or a one um and and the same holds for doing a, a startup or a company and making it successful it's not a zero it's not a one our job is to move the dial a little bit closer to the one right uh, and therefore have a better chance of making a successful company perhaps a unicorn and that's what this uh, this presentation is about so so moving on to the next step in understanding uh, so i'm going to talk about this uh, um this chart it's called the technology adoption life cycle it was introduced by a gentleman called jeffrey moore in uh, in his book uh, that came out in the in the early 90s it's called crossing the chasm right um, i believe this uh, chart is still very applicable pretty much to every company that gets started um, so so let's talk about this right so this is the first part of our understanding so 
on the x axis we have time going from left to right the time starts when the company becomes ready to launch its product um or or becomes ready to sell its product all right not when the company is formed so the start is when the company goes out in the market and raises its hand okay i'm willing to sell the product on the y axis we have the acceleration of adoption of the company's product um so over time of course and the, the the markets uptake the company's product right that's basically is a simple graph now you'll see different colors in the graph and the different colors correspond to different psychological profiles of uh, of customers adopting the company's product so let's talk about them uh, at a high level so the very first people who start adopting the product when you start selling it these are the orange guys um i am just going to call them early adopters for the purpose of this presentation but jeffrey moore the author of this graph he makes a distinction between innovators and early adopters right for the purpose of this presentation we are just going to refer to them as early adopters or the orange guys right uh, now their psyche their psychological profile is that they are not particularly um um you know interested in a product that has polish that uh, provides them with all the you know 10000 features that a that a old legacy product might have um they are the kind of people who would stand in a line when a new product comes out right uh, in a consumer store maybe when the apple came out with a new um, iphone or 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 another like uh, um, apple watch or something so they want to tinker with technology right or they are the kind uh, that just want to help you right i my when when i did my companies the early adopters were guys who just wanted to help an entrepreneur hey um, you know you're an entrepreneur i know i know how hard it is to build companies uh, i'd love to help you right and be part of my success they might be friends of friends or friends of your venture capitalist or or maybe an advisor right um or they might be people who understand the risks of being early adopters of a product but they also understand that if uh, the product succeeds they will um, get a jump start on their competition and the competition might be inside their firm whoever they work for or the competition might be external to that firm right a uh, competitive company Uh, so these are this is the psyche of the early adopters right now sometimes uh, startup founders they uh, they find success selling to some early adopters and they're like wow uh, this company is going to be unicorn <laughs> and the answer is no uh, the early adopters are not the ones that make the company a unicorn uh, it's actually the blue guys that will eventually determine if the company becomes a unicorn or not So let's talk about the psychological profile of the blue guys. They're called by Jeffrey Moore as the early majority. So the early majority guys are the people who would normally not buy from a startup. All right, um, they will not normally not buy a product that um, doesn't have the right polish, the right number of features, right? That sort of stuff. They're used to buying from. from um, you know polished companies companies that have been around for a while they're not tinkerers of very new technology the only reason they would buy from a relatively young company is because and i want to say this in double quotes <laughs> uh, it's because they have a pain they have a pain that no other company can solve right that's very important i'll talk about that multiple times during this presentation the early majority guys have a pain that no other company can solve uh, and that's the only reason they would look at a, a startup to buying a new for the purpose of buying a new product um but since they're used to buying products from from uh, startups I, i'm sorry from polished companies um they will give a lot of uh, trouble Uh, or friction 
to the young company before they will actually part with their money, right? And that's why this chasm exists between the orange guys and the blue guys. So they will put the company through the ringer, right? And many, many startups sort of die trying to cross the chasm. They're never, never able to land in the blue zone uh, successfully. Um, and that, so, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking, they try to make the jump across the chasm and die <laughs> trying to make that, make that jump. They'll fall somewhere in the middle. Um, so, so any, anyhow, um, you know, let's talk about these two things drawn in the blue zone, um, the bowling alley and the, and the tornado. So what happens when you go to the bowling alley? I'm sure many people in the audience have gone bowling. You know, when you throw the ball, uh, the ball hits a pin, right? Um, and the pin falls and, and the pin further takes down other balls. It's not just the ball that takes down the pins. It's also the falling pins that hit other pins and take down other. So that's why it's called the bowling alley. Um, in this case, when you um, try to close the first blue customer, they will give you a lot of trouble. But when they fall, when they are satisfied, um, probably five other customers are satisfied, right? Um, but then you go to the sixth customer and they probably have some different requirements. Uh, and so you go through the trouble again to satisfy them. And when they become satisfied, maybe 10 other customers are satisfied. And so you can close 10 other deals without any problem. And once you close a threshold number of customers uh, in the blue zone, suddenly magic would start and um, a, you know you'll grow you, you'll start growing phenomenally this is where, this is called the tornado effect right different people have different names for that uh, some people call it the the hockey stick effect right some people call it uh, product market fit this is when quarter after quarter um, you know there is no stopping you every quarter uh, you know your growth uh, is phenomenal. This is when companies start getting noticed. They start appearing in news articles. And believe me, all the companies, all the famous companies like Google and um, you know Netflix, and they all went through this. Uh, through this, it's just that we found out about them when they were riding that tornado, and that includes my companies, uh, you know, Nutanix and and Cohesity. I know how painful it was when they were trying to cross the chasm, but then the magic started happening and. Um, they started riding the tornado and it became fun. Let's quickly talk about the other phases of, uh, in, in this. Um, so the green zones, so to say. Um, you know, the, the first one is called the late majority. The psychological profile of these customers is that they would not buy from a startup no matter what. Right? Even if they have a pain, they will not buy. Um, the only reason to buy uh, is when they see enough of the blue guys buying, right? So they don't want to be left behind and they feel comfortable that since enough of the blue guys have bought, they feel comfortable that they can now buy the product. And finally, we have the laggards on the extreme right. These are people, um, you know, you can define them as um, they are the kind who will buy a digital phone when no rotary phones are left. So when there is no alternative, right, then, then they'll start buying. So the green guys are a little bit less important in the first few phases of the company for, for a startup. Uh, it's really the orange guys and the blue guys that are relevant to a startup. And, and I would say the following, um, it's the blue guys that make the company a unicorn. So always strategically, we are targeting the blue guys. From inception of the company, we are going to target the blue guys, even if we know that we will be selling to the orange guys, right? So this is the first piece of understanding I like to impart to you guys. Uh, we're always targeting the early majority and the early majority is identified by the fact that they have a pain that no other existing big company can solve. <coughs> All right, let's move on next to our understanding, uh, to the sales cycle, right? This is the cycle that a person in the company that um, sells the product is going to see. So the sales cycle uh, starts with a vision, right? A deck of slides. Um, basically, this is an idea 
you know that idea has to reach the the prospective customer somehow so that's where marketing plays a role so marketing's job is to take that idea what the company does to the customer and uh, once the customer sees it they like oh this company can solve my pain remember we are potentially targeting always the the, the blue guys um so so you you the customer sees something relevant um that they like so but they don't want to buy they don't trust you right you're a startup um you have no history you don't have a brand so they will put you through a customer trial or what is called a poc proof of concept and you know they're going to test for two things one is check boxes right and what is a check box you're you're selling a product that has uh, many similar features as um, you know you know a lot of other products um you but it has some new features some new things that it can do that solves a pain that the customer has um so the similar features are check boxes right when google came out with search um well it was a search engine that could provide search but the uniqueness was that it could search and provide much more relevant information so from the perspective of the fact that it was still a search engine was the check box right um is it fast or is it too slow uh, does it give lots of results uh, so those are the check boxes right uh, but the pain is the new thing the the product solves um so in google's case for instance it was um, relevant search results and and the customer is going to test for both of them they are not going to buy the product until it meets the check boxes and it addresses the pain remember this is a blue customer that we are targeting and these guys will only buy if uh, you're solving a pain right and once those two things happen they will um, you know buy the product or sale will happen and the job of the company is to in the initial phases is to remove friction out of this sale cycle so for instance if um, you know you're not getting to a customer trial the friction is probably in the vision or in the marketing of the vision right if it, it's in the idea itself or it's in the way the idea is being marketed to to the customers or if the sale is not happening then either you're not meeting all the check boxes or you're not really addressing a pain right a pain is defined to be something that uh, can be solved by only uh, aspirin uh, not a vitamin right a vitamin is is good to have and aspirin is a must have when you have pain or or choose your favorite headache medicine right um so that's how pain should be that they need a solution for that right now uh, and not something in 6 months or or one year or or what have you right uh, that's a vitamin you know vitamins can be postponed pain cannot be postponed uh, remedy for pain cannot be postponed right so so our job in the initial phases is to get the friction out of this uh, sales cycle this is what a typical sales guy would would see now now in this in this presentation i am talking about uh, enterprise sales where you literally sell a product to a customer now there are other kinds of companies that sell eyeballs right um, these are companies like facebook even google kind of falls in that it's the number of eyeballs um, and eventually money is made if you um, sell enough eyeballs uh, while i'll go i'm going to focus on selling a product um the same principle applies to 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 eyeballs right i gave an example of google where again you go through check boxes and pain points so so the same principles apply to companies that work more more on eyeballs rather than actually selling a product but in this presentation i'm going to use uh, actually selling a product because i'm going to take examples of my two companies later on nutanix and cohesity right so so we we've, we've spoken about the technology adoption life cycle we've spoken about the sales cycle uh let's talk about the next step in our understanding which is uh, the notion of a minimum viable product so remember i said uh, earlier that um, you know your vision ought to be grand your vision ought to be big um you know and the reason for that is if the vision is too small it's too easy to copy right if it takes like a couple of months 
for someone to copy your vision, then you can go nowhere. So, so for that reason, the vision ought to be grand, but then the risk you run is that you may run out of money. So how do we navigate that? Right? Um, so while the MVP, the minimum viable product, is a way to navigate having a big vision and not running out of money somewhere in the middle. So what you do is um, you identify a subset of the vision and you call that your minimum viable product. The requirement is that since we are always trying to target the blue guys, this subset of the vision should also address some pain points, right? Um, uh, and it should it should address the early majority. Um, so it still targets the early majority. Um, so so what you're going to do is you will so let's pretend that we are starting a company, right? So you've identified you have your grand idea that the company should do. You take a subset of that and you say this is my minimum viable product, and then you start kind of building the the product. Right, it's going to take us time, but you don't stop taking feedback from customers. You take feedback from customers before building the product, but also while building the product. Right, you want to make sure that the pain points don't move, that uh, you know they move because the markets have changed or um, somebody else came out with a similar idea uh, earlier than you. So you are continuously taking feedback from customers, and eventually you're going to announce the general availability of your product. You're going to raise your hand and say that. Um, that your your product is is sellable, uh, and so you go to the market with um, you know the general availability of the minimum viable product. So you tell the world, hey, I'm ready to sell the product now. So um, so this way, by defining the MVP to be a subset of the product, you make it very tractable. You still have the large part of the vision. Um, uh, the, to to execute on, but at least you've gone to market uh, with the subset of the product and shown some progress to venture capitalists, and that way you know they feel confident that since you're showing them progress, they can keep giving you money, right? So this is the reason why we go out with an MVP, minimum viable product. But let me ask you this: just because we have an MVP, a minimum viable product, uh, the V of the product viable means that the you know, uh, the early majority should buy it. But before you actually try to sell, it's not really viable, right? You don't know whether it's viable. For all you know, by the time you build the product, the MVP might take you a couple of years and then you try to sell it, <laughs> people may not buy it. Um, so, so how do you know it's well viable? And how do you, you know, you know, deal with that? So this slide kind of talks uh, about that aspect. So again, so this slide talks about the early phases of the company, um, described a little bit differently. So we start with a phase where you only have the vision, the you know deck of slides, just the idea. And initially, so you'll identify, like I said in my last slide, you will identify what the MVP is, right, minimum viable product, and you'll start building it. Um, and it'll take you some time, maybe a couple of years to 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 do that, or at least a couple of months. Um, and so the first phase that you reach after building the MVP is what I am going to call an unqualified MVP phase. It's unqualified because nobody has yet bought the product. You don't really know whether it's truly viable or not. So then you try to sell the product and you're going to encounter some friction. You know, maybe some early adopters will buy, but eventually remember our goal is to sell to the early majority. Um, and they will give you friction, like I said, right? So you will, in that time, refine the MVP, right? So um, you will take their feedback and you will continuously refine the product. Uh, and then you reach a, a stage where you're repeatedly selling the product, right? Um, and that is a phase that I'm going to call a repeatably sellable MVP phase. And, and once you reach that phase, the next part of the company is to press on the gas and generate lots of revenue, right? And the graphs I've been trying to show to you are all related to each other, right? Um, um, you're trying to cross the chasm. You have not crossed the chasm until 
you have reached the repeatably sellable MVP phase. Yeah. And your job, the job of the company, until you reach that phase, is to conserve capital, um, to be stingy with your money. But once you reach that phase, it's a mistake to be stingy with your money. Um, you have to now take over the market because once it's repeatably sells, the idea is known to the world um, and they will try to copy. The large companies will try to copy, right? So you have to be quick to take over the market. So going from the repeatably sellable MVP phase to the revenue, you know, generating the revenue, you've got to press on the gas. So be stingy earlier on, but later on you completely change gears and start making revenue. And in the middle, uh, you know, while you're refining the MVP is when you're trying to cross the chasm, right? So these are the early phases of the company and how they, they operate. Um, so I said, you know, by the way, most companies die because they just run out of money. 95% um, of the companies that don't succeed are of that kind. They just run out of money. Now, there are 5% of the companies that die because of some dispute, some lawsuit, you know, um, and that sort of stuff. But most companies just flat out of just flat out run out of money. So it's very important to understand how funding works. Like I said, nobody gives you all the money on day one. So this slide kind of talks about that. You start with a vision, uh, a deck of slides an idea and the first money that you raise is called seed money. Uh, so the job of seed money and a good seed, you know, it varies from company to company, but approximately it's about a million dollars. Uh, the job of a seed is to take you from the vision to a prototype, um, right? This is a proof of concept. This is not something that's sellable, but it cannot demonstrates to the venture capitalists or VCs that, um, you know, um, you can make some progress building the product and it kind of provides them with some proof on how the product is going to look like. So maybe you build a nice GUI, maybe you um, build some aspect of the product that shows how fast it is or how cheap it's going to be to make, although it's not polished, it's not ready yet to be sold uh, to a customer. So that's seed money. Uh, and again, ranges from company to company. I've seen seeds that are a few hundred thousand dollars. I've seen seeds that can be in multiple millions of dollars, but typically on average, it's about a million dollars. And once you've shown going from, you know, vision to prototype, then you raise your first big round of money called Series A. Uh, you know, a good, a good Series A is about $8 million, right? Um, and the job of a Series A is to take you from that prototype to the unqualified MVP phase, which corresponds to you are raising the hand and saying I'm willing to sell the product now. My product is complete. That's unqualified MVP. Even though people may not actually buy, uh, but at least you think you're ready to sell, right? That's an unqualified MVP phase. And, and so between the seed and the series A, you're uh, building the MVP. And then you raise your next round of mon money called series B. Uh, and that again, you uh, raise larger and larger rounds. So series B is about $20 million. Um, and that takes you from unqualified MVP to a repeatably selling MVP phase. So that the job of Series B is to refine the product. And once you're repeatably sellable, by the way, um, my the definition that I have for repeatability, um, and so uh, is 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 that an average sales guy can sell to an average customer without involving people in in the headquarters without involving the founders and, and, and so on and so forth, right? If you can do that, you've reached repeatability because now you can hire more and more sales guys and sell to more and more customers. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a very elite sales guy. It doesn't have to be very elite customer to understand your product. An average sales guy should be able to sell to an average customer without the involvement of all the smart people in headquarters. That's repeatability, right? And when you reach that, you reach the repeatably sellable MVP phase, right? It <laughs> doesn't have any friction. Uh, and like I said, uh, once you reach that, you now press on the gas. So you raise more money. You're still probably not profitable. Uh, you raise more money to start the tornado. And, and, and any subsequent rounds, you know, people sometimes raise uh, D, E, F, G. And even if they go public, uh, file for an IPO, uh, that's just a funding round, right? The difference is rather than raising money from VCs, you're raising uh, from, a, from a, the general public out there. 
Um, so you start the, the tornado and, and beyond. Uh, so this is how funding matches to, to development of the product. Now, is this always the way people, uh, the companies follow the funding uh, rounds? No, there is variability, but I can tell you if they're not kind of sticking to this uh, way of doing things, they're probably in pain unless they're a phenomenal company and they just raise one round and they can go all the way, which is very unlikely. Most companies follow this trajectory, but if they are not able to make the progress, uh, so if you are uh, trying to raise a series B and you have not even finished developing your MVP, you are going to face friction raising your series B. VCs are going to question whether they're throwing bad money behind good money and that sort of stuff, right? But this is how good companies execute. All right. So this presentation is mostly about the early phases of the company. This is the only slide I have that talks about the later phases. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, you know, sales is going to start selling what's on the truck, which is the MVP. Um, engineering is going to build further on the vision. Remember, MVP is just a subset of the vision. So <coughs> engineering is going to uh, enhance the current product. And, uh, and, um, and keep building. So this is how there is continuous innovation. So sales sells what's on the truck and engineering keeps putting more on the truck. And by the way, this is how um, you frustrate your big competitors, even if they try to copy you, right? So I'm trying to answer one of the questions. What if the competitors copy you? Well, this is how, by the time they copy what, uh, what you have on the truck, you have put more on the truck. And, um, and you're constantly ahead of your competitors. This is how Google, I was at Google for five years. This is how Google uh, beat Microsoft and Yahoo in, in competition. By the time Yahoo and Microsoft will copy what Google have, they would be five steps ahead because they had a much bigger vision. And eventually they both gave up. They said, Google is unbeatable. Let's <coughs> owe more money on trying to build a competing search, right? So that's what engineering does. And marketing is always marketing what's on the truck but also the bigger vision, right? They're always doing both. They're not just marketing what's on the truck. They're always educating the market on that bigger vision, okay? So this is how the later phases always work. Um, so, so to recap, you know, we, we learned the technology adoption life cycle. We learned the sales cycle. We learned about the, the notion of a minimum viable product. We learned about the early phases of the company. Um, and we learned about the funding steps and finally, you know, the, a little bit about the later phases, right? So that's a recap. Now let's move on to the next phase, which is uh, planning the journey, right? So again, we're gonna quickly lay out the blueprint of a company and, uh, and, then, and then the last phase would be executing the plan. So let's talk about planning. So look, you have an idea, you wanna to plan to build the company, but there are multiple questions to be asked. Uh, as part of planning, right? can you really truly build a company around it, right? Uh, or is it just a project within a company? You know, many people come to me for advice and they often bring me ideas that are a, a great project within a company, right? Uh, it'll enhance an existing company uh, in a lot of ways, in, in good ways, but it may not be a, a company by itself. Right? They're sitting in a company like VMware thinking that maybe they should, uh, rather than doing a project in the company, they'll go out and do a company on that idea, but it may be a perfectly viable project within VMware, but not uh, uh, a company by itself. So how do, you, how do you tell that? How do you um, make sure that you strike oil? Like I said, a typical venture partner goes through a thousand presentations. How do you make sure you strike oil in the very first go? Um, because they don't have time beyond the first one. If you, if they're disinterested on the first one, they likely may not even see it the second time, right? How do you strike oil in the first one? Can you build a sustainable business, right? Long term, can you protect it from competitors? So all these are some of the questions that we need to answer in the planning phase. Um, so what I've done uh, for brevity is I, I have come up with the 10 filters if you may, and I'll quickly walk you down these filters. Um, um, and these filters are so important that even, even if one of the filters is, uh, is a red, not a green, um, I ask the 
entrepreneur to work hard to convert it at least to a partial green, if not a full green. But if it's uh, if more than one filter is in the red, then I tell them that look, I don't think this ever will be a unicorn. Maybe it'll be a smaller company, and if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But I don't think this can be a unicorn, right? So this is how important these filters are. So let's go through them. Number one, how big is the truly addressable market, right? Um, and the answer is it should be greater than five billion dollars. Yeah. Why? Um, you know, because venture capitalists do not like to invest in small markets. If the market is, let's say, two hundred million dollars, and there are potentially ten companies operating in that market, every company is going to do about ten million dollars in revenue or so, right? Well, that's not enough to build a unicorn, right? If you're lucky, you'll generate twenty million dollars in that market. Still not enough to build a unicorn, right? Uh, and so the VCs will not even fund you. If your market is too small, um, your market ought to be uh, larger than at least five billion dollars. And taking examples from my two companies, Nutanix, my first company, you know, they brought um, hyperconvergence into the market. So basically, built, they built a platform uh, where they uh, brought compute and storage to live on the same platform, uh, and you can host um, virtual machines on that platform easily. Um, that was easily. Um, you know, a few billion dollars uh, to start with, and it was a growing market. So, so that filter was a pass for us. So, so did my company Cohesity, which started by disrupting the backup market, but then went on to the bigger vision of disrupting the data security and data management market. Uh, it was easy, easily a twenty billion dollar market. So, that filter was a pass for us. Next filter is how's the neighborhood? Um, you know, how, how are companies that have done similar things? Uh, are they healthy or are they making small exits or or even dying? VCs do not want to invest in graveyards. They want to invest in a healthy neighborhood, right? Uh, if there are lots of companies dying, they don't want to invest. So, for instance, Google might have been widely successful, and Google went IPO in two thousand four, but there are a lot of copycats that happened, and one by one, each of them died. So by two thousand seven. If you walk into a VC trying to raise money for a search startup, they would probably refuse because they don't want to invest in graveyards, right? That's an example. The third filter is that how long does it take to build an unqualified MVP? Um, and remember that we have to build the unqualified MVP uh, before our Series A funds, uh, you know, exhaust themselves. So you have to sort of look forward during planning. You have to estimate um, how much time it's going to take to build the product, how many engineers you want to hire, how many um, you know quality assurance people, everyone you need to build the product, um, um, and estimate how long it's going to take you, and estimate whether that's going to be um, enough um, for the Series A funds to not run out. So, so hindsight is 2020, but looking forward, you have to make that estimation. Um, and 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 only then this filter will be in the green. So I estimated, for instance, at Nutanix, that uh, we between our series seed and series A, we raised you know thirteen million dollars. I estimated it'll take us no more than eight million dollars to build that unqualified MVP, and it'll take us uh, about two years. Um, and and in reality, it took us uh, four million dollars, right? So this filter was a pass. Um, so, but um, but you have to do this looking, you know, looking forward, not in hindsight, for the planning. Next one is next filter is does the MVP address a clear pain? Remember, we are always trying to tar target the early majority, and the pain the the pain needs to be preferably immediate. Like I said, you need an aspirin, uh, not a vitamin, right? Uh, in my former company, for instance, Nutanix's case, the pain was that without Nutanix, people had to buy compute. From one vendor, right? Uh, any of the companies that sell, you know, servers, then you have to buy storage from another vendor. You have to put some network gear to connect the two, um, and then you could build infrastructure uh, on which to host virtual machines. And Nutanix came and it collapsed, you know, them. And and now you can run virtual machines much much easier. You don't have to go to three different vendors. Uh, it was much cheaper. 
and a variety of other benefits. So we were addressing a very clear pain. So this filter was a pass for us at uh, at Nutanix. The same thing goes for Cohesity. Um, you know, we we collapsed. You know, uh, Cohesity entered uh, by selling into the backup pain. Right. We addressed, uh, made the backups, enterprise backups, much simpler. Uh, and before going, you, you know, before us, you had to go buy backup software from one vendor, storage from another one. Uh, then some expensive hardware to on which to run the backup software from yet another one. It was a total mess, and we gave them something very simple. So there was a very clear pain. So this filter was a pass for us. Another one is: Are you in line with the industry trends? Right, because my strong uh, recommendation is not to swim upstream, not to go against the trends. Uh, if you go against the trends, uh, you know the world is working against you. If you are with the trends, the working the world is working for you. Right, better not swim upstream. In the case of Nutanix, for instance, um, you know, getting the networking out of the way was according to the trends because compute and storage um, speeds were were increasing tremendously, but networking is not. So getting them out of the way was uh, very aligned with the trends. And the another trend was simplicity and manageability. So these were all very strong trends um, that you know made this filter a green for for uh, Nutanix. And same went for my company, Cohesity. N next one is, uh, is there a sufficient barrier to entry? You know, let me tell you that um, patents are not sufficient barrier to entry. Um, you know, one of the, one of the, my playbook is to uh, have a one to two year lead, right? If, even if a competitor tries to copy you, the product is com complex enough, it will take you more than a year, preferably two years to copy. And by that time, you will build more on the vision, right? Your vision is larger than the MVP. So you can maintain that lead. So is there a sufficient barrier of entry? Sometimes the barrier to entry might be stickiness, right? If you go to eBay, you know, once every um, seller and buyer is on eBay, there is little incentive to do auctions elsewhere, right? Uh, so, so these are the barrier to entry. You need to make sure there's a barrier. Uh, in, in my company's cases, it's the complexity of the product that was the barrier. It was very hard to build web scale systems. So this filter was a green for us. Next one is how long does it take to get to $100 billion? So ideally it should be within five to seven years, right? Why $100 million? Because once you are generating $100 million in revenue per year, um, you're a unicorn, right? You apply a factor of 10 to revenue to become a unicorn. And again, uh, you have to estimate looking forward how long it's gonna to take to generate $100 million. And you do, do that estimation by comparing yourself to other products in the space, uh, how much they sell for, how much you're gonna start selling and how you're gonna grow, you're gonna make that estimation. And ideally it should be, uh, once you launch the company, once you uh, launch your MVP, within five to seven years, you should get there. If not, the VCs are not gonna be interested. If it takes too long to generate $100 million, uh, you know, VCs are gonna put the money in some other company, not in your company. And both my companies, Cohesity and Udonix, we estimated, It'll take us, um, you know, three to four years, um, actually five years, but in reality, both of them took about three, right? So this filter was a green for us. Next one, is it high touch or high volume? Because you can be both. A high touch product is a product that requires a lot of customer handholding, right? You're selling to an enterprise customer, perhaps. This is uh, where my two companies fallen. Uh, a high volume product is a product like Google. Uh, Google makes a few cents every time, you know, you click on Google's ads, but then they make it on volume. And every time you're unhappy with Google search, you don't want to call Google and complain, right? So that's why Google can afford to make money through volume. But a company like Cohesity cannot afford to make money by volume. It has to reach that $100 million um, with very few customers, uh, you know, not millions of customers. And so we need to be able to charge more for our product. Right. A lot of time entrepreneurs come to me and, and when I ask them how much uh, you're going to sell the product for, they're like, oh, $50 a seat or something like that. And they're like, how many seats are you going to sell in the first four or five years? Um, and that doesn't add up to $100 million. Right? So it's very clear that this is not going to be a unicorn. So you, if you are a high-touch product, you ought to be able to sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right? Uh, and if you cannot sell that, then you do not have a unicorn. On the flip side, if you have a high volume product, um, then you can um, sell for much less than that, but then make up in volume, right? So you need to decide that upfront. Um, uh, we estimated, by the way, in Nutanix and Cohesity that we could sell for more than $200,000. Uh, 
So, so to reach $100 million, we needed about 500 customers. That's quite doable, right? Um, and, and therefore, we were agreed. Next filter is, is the insertion point easy, right? Or is it a headache? Um, customers are not going to buy a headache, right? Let me give you an example. You know, there was a company called Nimble Storage. They first tried to build a cache in front of an existing um, product, an existing storage product. And that's an additional headache in, in, you know, not only are the customers managing that storage product, they uh, are also going to manage that cash. And so even if they buy, it's going to have a shelf life. They're going to push that uh, guy selling the storage product to, hey, build the cash yourself. Why do I have to go to another party to buy a cash? So this company, Nimble, had to pivot um, because their insertion point was not easy, right? So the insertion point the, has to be easy. In the case of my companies, we were eliminating a lot of headaches. Um, you know, both cohesity and Nutanics. And so the insertion point was really easy. So this filter was a green. And last but not the least, uh, what are the pivot points? Look, we can all drink our Kool-Aid. We think that our product is going to sell like hotcakes. Um, but when we actually come to selling, that may not be the case. So you need to have a plan B and a plan C if the plan A doesn't work. For Nutanics, for instance, um, we wanted, we initially, our plan A was to sell into VDI, virtual desktop in infrastructure, where people can host virtual desktops. On the platform but our plan b was to make it an analytics product right uh, and plan c was to sell to service providers did we uh, our plan a worked so we never had to go to plan b or plan c uh, but those were the pivots that we had planned for architecturally uh, that we could go to you know within two three months if the plan a didn't work and we even won an award for analytics right we uh, uh, in one of the vm world conferences we won an award on how fast we can uh, run uh, Hadoop on, on Nutanix and people are scratching their head. What is this VDI company doing with analytics? And that's basically because it was architected into the product, uh, you know, should they ever need it. Um, so these are the 10 filters. Let's move on uh, to future planning. So I like to, so, so this tells us whether the company is viable or not. And we plan the company accordingly. Now, I like to build a monthly plan until the minimum viable product. Um, and so I like to have Gantt charts for each function, for engineering, for product management, and more. And I like uh, hiring plans for each quarter. I literally know every quarter since inception how much I'm going to hire and what type of people, uh, especially the, the business hires. And, and then we need the financial plan because we need to know when our money is going to run out and when we're going to raise uh, A's, B's, and C's. And, you know, we will plan our quarterly burn rate. So uh, here is the plan for Nutanix, though no need to read through this. We will go through this in the execution section, right? Uh, Nutanix was founded in 2009, and here is the plan, at least a high-level plan. We'll go through, through that in execution. And here is the same one for Kuhisi. Um, So let's talk about execution, right? Like I said, I'll spend the least amount of time here. Um, I'll say a few things for, about execution before I walk you through those plans. I like to review quarterly progress against the plan, how we are doing, because the plan might need post correction, right? Plan, plans are plans, you miss plans, um, but you need to adjust them. But I always like to benchmark against the original plan. If I deviate too much, it kind of keeps me honest, it brings a sense of urgency. So uh, without further ado, let's talk about the, the plan of Nutanix. Let's step through it. So the first thing we wanted to do was prepare the proof of concept. Um, you know, Nutanix was founded in September 2009. We wanted to prepare a proof of concept by Feb 2010 and then raise the seed. Now, this was my first, first company. Um, clearly, I did not know that I could raise the seed before uh, preparing the proof of concept. So this uh, was, in, was green, right? Uh, we were able to raise seed. You know, some venture capitalists came in December 2009 and gave us seed money. Um, so this was green. And then we wanted to be code complete um, uh, by September 2010. Um, and, and we missed on that by three months. Uh, we were code complete initially, right? For code complete for internal purposes, for doing quality assurance and stuff. Uh, we were only code complete by December 2010. Uh, and then we wanted to raise, um, you know, you can think of this as somewhat of a prototype internally. And we wanted to raise our Series A uh, by September 2010. And some VC came and preempted us. We like, we know your reputations. We know you can build the product. 
you don't have to show us a proof of concept i'll give you series a and so that was agreeing they gave us series a much earlier in july and now we are headed towards selling the product but before we do that we want to place the product for trials in the hands of customers right um so we wanted to make it uh, make an alpha product ready by january 2011 and we missed on that by 3 months we were only able to do that um, by april 2011 um so we missed on that by 3 months um and then the customers gave it a spin they gave us some feedback uh, and that allowed us you know next to um launch the product say that we are ready to sell the product and we planned that for april but we barely given the alpha product to customers in april right we were delayed so clearly we're going to be delayed you know launching the company so sure enough we were 3 months late we launched it in july 2011 um and then we wanted to raise series b to refine the product to make it repeatable repeatably sellable and we wanted to do that you know by september 2011 we got pre amp <laughs> a vc firm came and gave us the series b much earlier um by july and finally we wanted to take it towards repeatability by december and we missed on that by at least 3 months um so you know in the big scheme of things this is a multi year plan yes we missed by a few months but the bigger point is if we did not have a plan we would have missed by a whole lot more right maybe a, a few years that's really the point it's not not the point that i missed by that we missed by a couple of months and so um you know literally in actual execution by summer of 2012 we knew that we were firmly in the bowling alley right in that blue segment and by 2013 we knew that we were riding the tornado and eventually the company went ipo in 2016 and today it's uh, valued at about 6 plus billion dollars right so that's the story behind utonics in the interest of time i will not go through the story on 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 cohesity it's a similar plan uh, and again the plan we missed it you know you can see the last step of the plan we uh, the company was founded in 2013 uh, you know i built a multi year plan the last step of the plan was supposed to be done by december 2016 and in reality it took me six more months so again you know a multi year plan literally spanning over 4 years we missed by 6 months but again the the idea is that if we didn't have this plan we would have missed by a lot more and and uh, uh, you know we raised a funding round in uh, early 2018 that made us uh, a unicorn softbank was the lead investor in 2018 and that uh, made us a unicorn and we've enjoyed our unicorn status since then so i'll i'll summarize uh, you know success in startups is not all about luck um my contention is that luck comes to those who understand this journey who plan for it and then you know they know how to execute that plan so thank you so much for listening to me and apologies again for being late but thankfully i was able to manage it all within the time so i'll take some questions now any questions Uh, thanks a lot mohit uh, yeah really enjoyed the talk uh, and thank you also for taking out the time i know it's very late uh, at your place so let's take questions uh, questions from the audience yes can you come here and talk yeah and yeah just stand here and speak uh, hi uh, my name is ranjit uh, i'm a computer science student in uh, in iit jammu just in case you have a job in any of your company <laughs> <laughs> so i have two questions if the time permits one is uh, did the uh, the pain points uh, change over time or did it was it like stable from the start or like when you started cohesity and utanix and second one is how did you why did you start cohesity when you already had a a uh, unicorn in the beginning like uh, when your hands were already full like what made you like uh, you know start another company like this right. thank you so so remember i said um, that even while building the product you need to get continuous feedback from customers so the pain points were very solid um 
now over time you may discover more pain points as you continue to get feedback and as the markets evolve but the very first few pain points you address they better be very solid if they're not solid you know you're not going to be successful you can't keep uh, you know morphing your product to suit different um, goal posts your goal posts cannot be moving so you're always addressing you know a uh, very well defined pain points uh, and even if you know people are surprised sometimes people join my companies and um, they see my initial talk um, they're surprised that uh, you know what even the problems you're addressing today are problems i foresaw like 9 years back so the pain points were pretty solid they better not change if they do then you need to pivot right that's why you define your pivot so you actually have multiple pain points in mind just in case the first one was not quite the real one people are not willing to buy enough then you um, you know um, pivot to a different pain point um, a different entry point in the market then that's how you take out or if the first one works then as you iterate on the vision right remember your your mvp addresses the first pain point but the future iterations of your product can perhaps address the other pain points you found uh, but the pain points better be pretty solid uh, if they are moving goal posts then you will not be able to do the company now to answer your second question um, you know i look i have a passion for doing companies i don't quite do companies for money uh, you know if i if money was the important part then i uh, I, i could retire after google i spent 5 years at google helping well what is called the google file system right i was a 600th employee at google um if if the, if i was into this for money then i would retire right after google um but i do this for my passion and uh, you know three and a half years into building my first company nutanix i found uh, you know roughly nutanix if you map, map the world of data into an iceberg uh, nutanix addresses the tip of the iceberg right uh, which is the production stuff and then there was a large part of the iceberg that still remained to be addressed uh, that was the lower part of the iceberg right the 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 tip of the iceberg is you can call it primary data and the lower part of the iceberg is the secondary data and i was uh, passionate enough to see that there is an even bigger problem lurking beneath the surface of water in the iceberg and so that led me to form my second company quickicity um and you cannot do you know both companies uh, in under the umbrella of one company both the ideas cannot be pursued um they are independently big ideas and so that's some of the history that um, that came about right so that's why but anyway good questions thank you for the questions uh thank you mohit uh, one more i guess i can ask a question i mean for, you know most of the audience here is very young uh so i mean how did you know what what uh, what experiences led you to identifying the first pain point you know for the new tenex was it the google uh, google experience was it was it a phd and and i mean uh, as a follow up to that you know what what would you advise the young people uh, to uh, to kind of explore today so that they are also successful in identifying the right pain points yeah great question so i'll start with the how i noticed the pain point uh, for um for uh, nutanix um you know i was at google and look sometimes you make observations and it's not very clear to you right there that you can do a company on this but then when you actually sit and you know think about the idea is to pursue for a company then you look at your observations in the past few years and you you realize something that clicks so let me tell you the story behind nutronics you know this was uh, i i was at google uh you know i joined google in 2003 and this was around 2005 um like i said i i was part of a team that built uh, the google file system it was the first web scale file system in the world and google had to build that because google uh, would have otherwise ha- have to buy storage from other vendors and that would be incredibly expensive so google built a web scale file system but they started using it initially like a traditional storage vendor right so they put uh, you know the web scale file system or all the servers that implemented the web scale file system on on one side and then they put their compute on the other side and they connected that with some expensive networking uh and this was google's way of running their applications and very soon they found that they were spending a lot of effort 
trying to tune the network. The network speeds were a bottleneck. And so Google came up with an idea that why don't we merge the two sides, right? Why don't we bring compute and storage together? So in Google's terms, Google, everything runs in Linux. So they ran the Google file system processes on, on Linux, as well as their compute processes, which at the time did map reducers or what have you, right? Uh, and so this was Google's crude way of doing hyperconvergence, which worked for Google, right? Because Google is its own customer, but it would not have worked for the real world because in the real world, the storage and the compute don't trust each other, right? They're independent industries. And so when I, four years later, um, uh, after I joined Google or five years later, right? Uh, when I started my company, uh, Nutanix in 2009, um, I thought about that problem. And like, if that was a problem for Google, it should also be a problem for the real world out there. Uh, so how do I bring compute and storage together? And how do I solve this problem that compute and storage don't trust each other? And the answer to that was virtualization use virtualization to put a put a virtual boundary between compute and storage. So the storage stuff can run on a VM and the compute stuff can run on a VM and they're separated safely through virtualization, right? So that was how we connected the dots and that's how Nutanix was formed, right? And a similar story behind Cohesity, I think I was at Nutanix at the time, uh, people were actually, our customers were not backing up a Nutanix and that had me wonder why found that backups were very complex. Um, so I knew there was a problem there to be solved. Um, but it's never a great idea to jump on the first problem that seems visible, just like what I did at Nutanix. <clears throat> Maybe there's a bigger thing here. So I found, I divided up the world of, um, you know, data into this primary data, which was the tip of the iceberg, which is what Nutanix was doing. And, then the rest into second data. And the idea was, how about we build one platform that could consolidate all of second data, right? Um, bringing all of it together on one platform. That would not only solve the backup problem, which is people had to go to three different vendors or five different vendors to build a backup platform, but also do way more. It could bring test and dive on the same platform, analytics on the same platform. It could take you to the cloud. That's how, kind of how Cohesity was born. Um, but but the way my advice to entrepreneurs would be, you know, if you are building a company, don't be in a hurry to jump on the first idea that you see. I would rather start, you know, let's say, uh, start with the segments of the market where you can do a company, where you feel proficient. For instance, you may start with the big data segment or the security segment, right, or the data segment or something like that, uh, or the gaming segment, whatever your proficiency is, and then study every company that got funded in that segment in the last, let's say three to five years, right? Uh, why did that company get funded? What was behind that company? You know, remember VCs do a lot of uh, due diligence before they fund. So, so those companies must be addressing some, some real idea, some real problem, sorry, um, for the VC to be interested in funding the company. So if you study all those companies and what they're doing, then you will also start seeing trends. And you also start seeing gaps that will appear in the future because of those trends. And then you can map that to your observations from the past and you know, figure out what to do. I did the exact same thing when I did Cohesity. I actually, you know, yes, I knew about some of this stuff that backups is a problem, but I did not jump on that right away. Um, I looked at every segment that I could do a company in. At the time it was big data, security, uh, a, a number of uh, different segments. I studied for uh, all the companies that got funded in the last three years. We actually had a small group of people who used to come and we would give assignments to them. They would uh, study a company, give a presentation, right? Every day we would have a session like that. And, and we did that for a couple of months. And by the end of that, we started getting a pretty good idea of what the problems are going to be in the future. Remember, it's not the problems of today that matter. Somebody's probably already trying to solve them. It's the problems of tomorrow that are important. And you, you uh, figure, that out, uh, figure that out with uh, this, this exercise. So that's what I would you know, advocate that you guys do. And then as you find those gaps, then you can map some of those gaps to your observations from the past perhaps, 
uh, and then think of doing a company. But even there, it's not enough. You have to then get continuous feedback from customers. You have to go to them and ask, hey, if I build a product like this, would you buy? Is this of interest to you, right? Um, so this is the process that you have. It's, it's a complicated process. People don't realize how hard it is to um, s do the setting right. And my goal here in the presentation I did today was to tell you some of that stuff, right? So that you all can be successful in doing a unicorn one day. Yeah, thanks Mohit for that. So I have a question. Um, so some of us here are academics and uh, some of the students here might be wondering if they should do a PhD. So I was wondering if your academic training, since you have seen both the worlds, did your academic training help in some ways and did it get in your way in some ways when you did your startup? Thanks. So great question. You know, believe it or not, I um, had the same question whether to do a PhD or not. Um, but I will tell you as I stand today that uh, I gained incredibly and um, inc an incredible amount through my PhD. Now, let's define what a PhD does. Yes, you do the PhD in some area, right? Yes, you at the end of your PhD, you likely will become a big expert in that area. But uh, that's really not why you do a PhD, right? Uh, you do a PhD to learn how to learn, <laughs> or rather, let me state it this way. Um, before doing a PhD, you, um, whatever knowledge you have acquired, you, you, you've acquired is uh, generated by someone else. Some, somebody else writes a book or a paper uh, and you just read it and you acquire knowledge that way. A PhD teaches you how to generate knowledge, right? Um, how to invent new things. And that is incredibly useful. Um, you know, there's um, literally a quantum jump in your mental elevation once you know how to generate knowledge, not just to acquire knowledge. And companies are all about generating, you know, new innovation, new things, right? This has never been, it looks easy in hindsight. I don't know if it's a problem at our end or is it uh, sorry suddenly can, you not, can you not hear me sorry hello hello can you guys hear me oh, he's the audible in team so my issue can you hear me now yes we can hear you now yeah thank you all right yeah, I changed my mic. When did you when did you guys lose me? Uh, this quantum jump in mental health. Yeah, okay, so, so good. So I was saying that um, literally a PhD, a good PhD, look, there are also bad PhDs, right? Uh, you need to do a good PhD, which means that you need to do it um, under a good advisor. And if you do that, it can be very rewarding. Um, I was trying to tell you that um, a PhD more than the subject that you do a PhD on, it's more about learning how to generate new knowledge. So far in your student life, you have learned how to acquire knowledge, but that knowledge was <laughs> generated by someone else. As part of the PhD, you learn how to generate new knowledge. And very frankly, entrepreneurship is all about generating new things, things that have never been done before, right? Uh, that's what an innovative company does. It all looks cool and easy in hindsight, but imagine the world of an entrepreneur who did not have the benefit of that hindsight, right? They're generating something that has never been generated before, that has never been done before. And that, that is where the PhD really helps, even if you don't want to pursue an academic career, a research career. So yes, my PhD has really helped in bringing the clarity of thinking to me uh, as I think about these companies, right? Uh, very honestly, the data space is a very, you know, it's not a new space. It's a space where tons of companies exist and it's a, a industry that's been around for 30 plus years. And people often question, how come you're able to come up with stuff that not only no, no one has thought before, but people thought that this is a saturated market, no new ideas left. And it's really the ability to kind of generate new knowledge. And that comes from my PhD. So that's how I would answer that. 
So thanks uh, a lot you, for that answer. If you, uh, have, if you do have the patience to do a PhD, I would strongly recommend it. It, it helps you a lot later on. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Yes, please. Could you come here? Yeah, please. Hello, hi, I'm Amit. I'm Yeah, you need to speak a lot. Louder. Yeah, I just want to know, like a uh, lot of ideas came in my mind. How did you find out that this idea can be the million or million dollar idea? Like uh, when we do the risk analysis, we find uh, like all the ideas have the huge amount of risk and mostly we drop the idea. So what all factors are ki this this idea can realize the world? How did you find? Yeah, so like take it through the 10 filters I had, right? Uh, I gave you those 10 filters. Take your idea through those 10 filters. <clears throat> and if they are all in the green and be brutally honest with you, I've seen people, I give them the 10 filters, but they're not being brutally honest, right? They, I'll give you one example. Uh, I told you one of the filters is how big is the neighborhood? Uh, I'm sorry, how big is the market, the truly addressable market? So I had a, a person who came to me, he, they had some idea in the desktop space. And they were, I'm like, how big is the truly addressable market? And they added the market, the market caps, market capitalizations of all the companies that are doing anything in the desktop space. He added the market capitalizations of uh, Microsoft and Intel and Apple. And <laughs> I'm like, dude, that's not your truly addressable market. You're not, when you have your product, you're not going to displace Microsoft and uh, Intel and Apple you're not building a product that even competes with them. You need to look at your niche, right? And then imagine you are incredibly successful and you're able to kill all competition in your niche, whatever that niche is. And you need to then add the market caps of those companies uh, to come up with a truly addressable market, right? And if that is more than $5 billion, then you have met the filter. So, so basically you need to be brutally honest with those filters and not wing it you know that this is where entrepreneurs sometimes they want to you know almost believe that all the filters are green they don't want to actually ask the hard questions but if you do ask the hard questions you will get real answers and and if all the filters are in the green then probably you have um, you know again it's never a zero or a one right it doesn't make it a one but it moves it pretty darn close to a one that uh, the probability of uh, success uh, of building a multi-million dollar company here for possibly a unicorn. And what are your vision regarding your both the companies? Like you will expand in terms of product and services or you will try some new domain also? Like some other problem? So, yeah, so far I'm very committed to my current company. I think there's a lot of future potential. So that excites me. There's a lot of innovation again, and I'm, I'm a technologist, right? Um, so I listed my title as the founder and CEO. I, I was uh, until recently the CEO. Uh, three months back, we uh, I decided that I'll focus more on the technology front. Uh, I'm a technologist, so we brought in a great guy to run the company as the CEO. So I'm actually not the CEO anymore. I'm I've taken on more a technical role. I'm the chief technology and product officer of the company. Uh, so my goal right now is to keep uh, rolling up my sleeves and uh, build on the innovation and technology. Um, so that's my passion. That's what I do, uh, whether I do it in this company or, or, or another one, but I don't have right now, um, thoughts about starting another one, you know, maybe one day, but not right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So Mohit, I have one last question. You did your undergraduate in, uh, in this department, computer science engineering, IIT Delhi, and these two, uh, the students that we have today, they they are actually visiting us for the first time, and this is probably the first talk that they heard uh, in IIT Delhi. So, you know, and you have donated, and and I want to say that this is, you know, this is based on the donation that you have uh, given our department. So, do you want to say some words about your association with the department, and uh, you know, anything? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I I would say I would start by saying that I have a lot of nostalgia about the department. Um, you, you know, uh, I'll start by saying this that look, guys. Um, uh, you know, how about I tell you the very first time I went in front of Sequoia, right? Sequoia is known to be the world's best early stage investor. Um, you know, I listed, uh, you know, my, uh, my degrees from other universities and Sequoia was like, you know, Mohit, 
your other universities are fine, but what we really like is the IIT on your <laughs> on your resume. We really like people from IITs, right? So even more than you know the university where I did my PhD, they actually you, you know respected me because, me because I was an IITian, right? So that's the kind of respect uh, even top uh, you know venture capitalists in the world have for IIT, and 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 so my association with the you know the fact that I did my bachelor's from IIT Delhi is a large part of what defines me even now, right? Uh, and you'll find that even you know um, uh, a few uh, days back, I was in a gathering where people were uh, very proudly talking about their JEE ranks, <laughs> uh, and these are people who are in their 50s and 60s, by the way. <laughs> so that's that's how um, you know we get defined, get defined by. by by IIT, by IIT and, and, uh, and and the department where we did our, did our uh, you know bachelor's i i'm very fond of our computer science department i gave a, a donation to them uh, a few years back so kind of giving back right uh, to to a department that has given me so much and also so, so many of my batchmates um, maybe my batchmates uh, some of them are not in the same uh, fortunate position as the, some of the rest of us. Um, so the rest of us do owe it to the department and give something back for uh, the new generation like yourself, right? So that you guys can also carry the torch that we we started. I can tell you in my time, I think we were the first few in the world from IITs to do companies. And now it's thrilling to see every year so many great companies are done by IIT. And I think IIT Delhi ranks one of the top ones. Uh, for doing companies, so we want you guys to carry the torch and give some back to the department that has uh, made you what you are, right? So that's my association, and that's how um, how I feel about the department and IIT in general. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Noel. So thank you once again. Uh, let's let's uh, thank our speaker uh, and. Thank you so much for taking out the time. I know it's very late on a Sunday evening. Uh, so thanks, Mohit, and um, yeah, thank you. All right, guys, have a have a good day. And once one more time, I don't usually do this, but my apologies for being 30 minutes late. I'm never late normally. I, I just got stuck somewhere. No problem. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Bye bye.